नमस्कार प्रोफेसर यूनस आपका स्वागत है वेलकम वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन एंड थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू फॉर दिस ऑनर ऑफ बींग पार्ट ऑफ दिस एफर्ट सो प्रोफेसर यूनस वॉट इज योर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी फ्रॉम चाइल्डहुड ऑफ इधर द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ नॉन वायलेंस well as i can go back to my experience the most important experience i see uh, was the uh, independence movement as a child watching things happening all around me everything is about the uh, independence this azadi is coming pakistan is going to be created we are all excited about pakistan so we are uh, in the midst of uh, people who are uh, all looking for pakistan so it's not independence as such is a pakistan we are having pakistan so everything about pakistan the flags and then uh, slogans and the demonstrations and the illuminations when the 14th august came that was an exciting moment uh, so i still remember that uh, this was uh, 1947 i was 7 year old so <clears throat> and that's one part the other part is uh, as uh, this is bubbling it's uh, moving uh about the another part of independence which i didn't see but the keep hearing and see the people is the uh, uh the revolutionaries the people who uh, like uh, surja sen and uh, um kudiram who sacrificed their lives to hang and the uh, armory raid in chilagam and the heroes of armory raid where they used to sit where they used to do things as a curious child looking at those things so this is another part of uh, my memory the other part is the riots uh, the religious riots people being killed and hiding thing hiding from each other so that's another part that's a real violence uh, right in front of you see that uh, so this continued in, uh, after the independence also it's not just a limited to pre independence but post independence also so this is all about uh, these are the element of uh, memories at that time the uh, thing the uh, the hindu muslim divide and the racial uh, not racial the religious divide to the extent of riots happening but uh, the city that i grew up the town i grew up was more uh, calm the very uh, lots of uh, um, uh, good will between the two communities unlike many other places uh, in bengal at that time uh, but uh, still we had uh, elements which uh, still i remember uh, specifically what happened so those are the memories that we grew up with did gandhi ji feature at all in in your childhood mind uh you remind me one radio in the whole house uh, so we we'll gathered around that radio listen independence day was a big event everybody is gathering celebrating the other one i remember very vividly uh, suddenly uh, uh, the whole house uh, was shut in silence uh, gandhi ji was assassinated and my father who is a staunch muslim leader is a very religious man he genuinely supported the cause of pakistan and standing before the radio and crying so there's the memory that i can share so this is same people and i remember uh, nehru came to chitagong uh, to address a public meeting at that time i was in uh, you were listed in school uh, the pre- uh, low grade in primary school so with the whole excitement in the city i remember it still very clearly the nehru ji is coming So everybody is uh, wearing good clothes and going to the yeah maidan yeah and then the opposite of non-violence uh, the uh, the revolutionary war that created that led to the birth of bangladesh did that also shape your future life because you have dedicated your life to working against structural violence and before we talk about the economic dimension i'm i'm just keen to understand in what ways the uh, physical violence that you may have witnessed in 70 71 if that shaped you in any way 
Uh, I was in the USA at that time teaching in the university, uh, teaching economics. Mm -hmm. So I immediately, uh, as soon as I heard the news on the radio and the television at that time, that uh, Bangladesh has declared independence. And immediately there were six people from Bangladesh uh, or East Pakistan at the time in the city that I was in, National Tennessee. So we immediately assembled right away together. And I decided and proposed that uh, let's declare uh, ourselves uh, we are citizens of Bangladesh. And we created Bangladesh uh, Committee uh, to uh, continue this uh, struggle until legally and uh, national, internationally we were recognized as independent. So from then on, I dedicated uh, everything to the cause of Bangladesh. And I left the school. Uh, this was summertime. I came and I left the school and went to the uh, Washington, D.C., set up a Bangladesh Information Center to lobby at the uh, Senate and the House, persuade the uh, U.S. senators and congressmen uh, to stop military aid to Pakistan. So how to move the resolution, how to lobby with the staff, explain things. Uh, they were saying, you don't have enough information, you cannot give us any information. So we're desperately looking for information. So, uh, and they said there is no, uh, some, we went to the embassies after embassies. Many embassies says, do you have a government in exile? And we didn't have a government in exile. Then I decided that uh, we should go in, in the nearest part of Bangladesh, uh, which is under control of Pakistan and form a government in exile. Mm -hmm. So you know, before I could come, I sent one of my friends to go and make contact so that I can come and then we'll have a government declared out of nothing. But people, because believe that otherwise you have no chance of having any, anything at all unless you have a government in exile. So by the time uh, it all happened, uh, within one or two weeks, actual uh, government in exile was formed. So we felt relieved that, yes, now we have a government in exile. We have a prime minister, we have everything in uh, the cabinet and um, or our secretariat. So we started communicating with that. So this is the part. And then I, uh, when Bangladesh actually became independent at the end of 1971, I resigned from my job at the university. I said, I'm going back. So I came back. So I saw the devastations and all the things happening. In the meantime, keeping track, and I started right at the moment uh, we heard about the uh, declaration of independence on uh, March 23rd. Then uh, we said, uh, let's have a newsletter, Bangladesh newsletter. So we started issuing a newsletter. I, I was the one who was uh, putting it together. So that information was generated and passed on. So through that, I had lots of atrocities and other information that we needed to have for uh, uh, for the news, newsletter readers communicating with them. But coming and seeing it on the ground is completely different. I mean, that's a story that that event that I didn't see, but I saw the aftermath of it. And then very early after that, your attention shifted to the poverty around you, and. Unlike many other people who may seek to do palliative measures, uh, you tried to go, I think, to the heart of the matter, of the sources, of what kept people poor. So uh, at, would you like to share something about your understanding at that stage of the structural violence of the economic system and then how you came up with the solution for it? I, I know you've told this story many times before, but I'm trying to to uh, just bring forth to highlight uh, how your effort was a response to the structural violence that you saw around you, which you then answered uh, with microfinance. Uh, I came with a lot of uh, excitement that now I'm coming back to home, back home, an independent country. Uh, now we can do everything that we wanted to do. Nobody can stop us because uh, nobody can control our future. Uh, so all those dreams uh, came with me and I joined Chittagong University uh, as a teacher, as an pro uh, associate professor, and also the chairman of the Department of Economics. 
So I was very excited that now I can mobilize things, students and things. In the post-war, post-liberation war, everything was in tetras, everything was in shambles. Classes don't help, exams don't take place uh, because young people are still coming back from the uh, battlefields with the guns are still in their control, still they have the uh, revolvers in their uh, positions. So hardly anybody cared for anything, teachers, schools, classes, exams, and so on. So I was trying to bring some, rest restore some discipline in the education that I'm supposed to uh, impart. Uh, but as we still, we are hoping that something exciting will come out of all this uh, devastations and everything. Uh, economic situation, instead of improving, started sliding down very sharply. By 1974, it became a famine. So ended up with a famine, people dying. And that's a very shocking moment for everybody. And me particularly, I couldn't understand why you have to have a famine, people dying of hunger. We used to read about famine of 1943, Bengal famine, and it looked like a storybook thing. It cannot happen in real life. But today it's right in front of your door, you see people almost dead. You see. And it's not in one corner of the country, it's everywhere. So all your dreams turn into nightmare. That was a nightmare we are in. Then the uh, offshoot of that, uh, I became very upset with the subject that I teach, economics. I said economics uh, is a make-believe story. It has no muscle, no in, and kind of a uh, content in it, which will be used to overcome, help people overcome their hunger and so on. It's a big talk, no thing, nothing in the world. Uh, so as I was uh, feeling, I thought I was totally useless for a person. I cannot help people. Subject I learn is a useless subject. It doesn't give me any tools, any equipment to do at least one thing to help people. Everything is just a fuzzy thing. So, uh, nothing concrete there. So as I was uh, feeling very upset and depressed, uh, I didn't know where to begin, what to do. All I was to do was I trying to find a word for me, use for me. Uh, what is the use, usefulness in me? Is as a human being, I need to be useful to something. So luckily, Chittagong University is surrounded by villages, so it's not urban-based university. I could cross the boundary of the university, which is a brand new, beautiful campus, like any other campus anywhere in the world. But the moment you step outside the boundary, it's a traditional thousand-year-old village. So nothing changed. It's worse because of the liberation war and all the turmoil that it's caused. Uh, so I would go in the village and spend time with me, hours and hours talking to people. My intention was to see if I can find an opportunity to make myself useful to at least to one person for one tiny thing for that day. If I could find something like that, I feel very happy that, day, that I've done something for somebody. So that's what I was trying to do every day. I didn't want to miss that opportunity and meet people, new people, old people, and so on. But I always searching for that opportunity so that I feel that I have some worth uh, use in me that I can share with others. And that's what makes me very close to the village, uh, intimately with the persons, with the families, with the children, with their old and young, everybody. So I learned lots of things by doing that. When you go there every day, everybody knows you, you know everybody, and you tell, hear the story. So, uh, and one thing came repeatedly uh, to me about on the big teams of the loan sharks, people who took little money, $1 worth of money, $2 worth of money. But person who lent you that money grabbed everything that you got in the name of the loan. And I've never read all these things in my economic courses anywhere that people can be so cruel to each other by lending such a small amount of money. You are taking away from whatever little position the other person has. And I could talk to the victims in details what happened. And I could talk to the loan shark himself because he's in the same village too. He's a nice guy. He felt he did something good to him by lending the money. 
He didn't feel that he has anything being bad. He said, well, that's the way it is. I, I couldn't help it. That's the traditional way that you charge, and I charge that. Otherwise, how can I give him the money? So the more I hear, more get, I get upset that uh, all the stories that I have in front of me. One thought came to me, how do we address that? How do we protect these people from their own shots? I was in a mode of protection, protecting the people. And again, look for, search for the economics textbooks. There is nothing about it. Nobody told you how to protect people from loan sharks. They don't even talk about loan sharks. Forget about protecting. So I said, again, it proved its worthlessness. I looked for it. Never, they never taught me this. But now I'm searching for it. I can't find anything about it. Rather, literature is full of those stories. About the dramas, about the plays, about the stories, about the... Um, uh, lots of novels written on, on those kinds of things, but never in economics. So mm, what do I do? So one desperate thought came to my mind, forget it. Why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money, the person is protected. He or she doesn't have to go to the loan shark. And I have saved one person from, protect, uh, from loan shark. And the money involved is so, so small. I didn't mind anything at all. I started it. People started taking it. In the beginning, they didn't take me seriously. They thought, I'm another loan shark. Kind of selling my things in a kind of friendly way. But ultimately, I'll do the same thing. So they took time to trust me and so on. Then it became bigger and bigger. Luckily, I have plenty of money in my pocket because I'm coming from the U.S. with all my uh, income earned during those previous years. So I could use that. I enjoyed it. I became very happy that I can do something concrete and reach out to so many people doing that. And that one after another, and uh, there was opposition to that. There's a religious opposition to what I was doing. One basic thing which drew a lot of uh, attack on me. I decided, again, uh, because in the meantime, battle became between me and the banks. I was accusing the banks that they don't, not only don't lend the money to the poor people, they don't lend money to women of any income level, not just for any income level. I said, that's a shame. That's completely uh, unacceptable. And they were always attacking me and saying, this is your big mouth, you're not doing anything. This is just a show that you present. Uh, so what I did, uh, I wanted to make sure I practice what I say, that I start lending money to women. So I made a decision that half the borrowers in my program must be women. It was the toughest job I ever had because women said, oh, don't give it to me. I can't handle money. I never touch money in my life. It's always my husband who touches money. I don't know how to count. I don't know what it is. And I don't want to make trouble in my family. I have enough of a trouble myself because they are all born as a trouble in the family because the parents were never happy having a girl child. So she's always reminded that uh, she brought misery to the family being a girl child. So she didn't want to add to that misery by taking money and not knowing what it is. So it was a tough job for us. And I was repeatedly telling my students, I'm working with my students now, to the girl students to talk to the women. When they said, no, the women don't want the money. I said, no, no, don't give it up so easily. I said, the reason they don't want to take the money it's not because they cannot handle it. It's because of the fear. Fear of everything they have been born with. So our job is to peel off that fear, layer by layer, hoping that someday that fear will overcome and somebody will peek through those layers of fear. So maybe I should do something. And we should wait for that, but not give up in the meantime because we have to peel off that layers. It took us six years to make that happen, but we never gave up. After six years, finally, we got to the 50-50 level. It was a big celebration for us. And then on, we saw money going to the family, to women, brought so much more benefit to the family. But the same amount of money that went to the family, to men. So I can count them how it is beneficial. Yeah. Then I told my students, I said, forget about uh, men. Let's concentrate on women. That's the best thing to do. And ever since, we concentrated on women. And it became... 97% women. Even now, it's around 97% women. We could have made it, made it 100%, then people say, ah, it doesn't work with me. I said, no, it works. Yeah. But the result is not as good as the women. 
Professor Yunus, would the world be a better place today if your work had been honored with a Nobel Economics Prize rather than a Peace Prize? Because it still means that what you have been honored for of is your very uh, huge contribution at the humanitarian level. But this work challenges the fundamentals of economics. And uh, to what extent do you feel that the discipline of economics and the macroeconomic thinking and it's how it is uh, treats a lot of the violence around it and created by it as invisible to what extent have you do you feel you have succeeded in shaking that well i was uh, kind of confronted with that question in the beginning much more aggressively and uh, repeatedly uh, I said, well, do I ask me, ask those committees who make the price? I cannot explain to you. But the short answer is, it really doesn't matter for me. The, uh, the fact that the Nobel Committee of one kind, uh, peace, have recognized us as uh, something worth the prize, that gave us a tremendous amount of attention. That's what is important part for us, because we are always being neglected, we pushed around and so on and thought uh, one easy way is a crazy thing, it will never work, it's just a temporary thing. So once you get the Nobel Prize, suddenly all those things become very important, what you say, what you do. On the previous day, it was a crazy thing, you are nobody. The next day, every word you say is some wise word, suddenly you become a wise man because you have done something. And whatever you say is very important. So that importance came, recognition came, attention came, and we wanted to do push our ideas through that window that now that we have attention of it. Uh, that was useful to us, whether it was economics or people don't care, people know Nobel Prize. So mm -hmm. to that extent, yeah. it's okay. Well, economics doesn't feel that this is the kind of thing they should recognize, that's up to them. Uh, but I see that they, they, they may not have their own ideological uh, um, direction in that path that we are talking about. No, the reason I ask that, Professor Yunus, is because uh, your work now over the last many years of uh, advocating a kind of uh, free from profit business, a business where the profit is generated in various forms of human well-being rather than only in terms of money. That is very... Uh, uh, it, it is very out of the box from the conventional economic systems. And so I'm curious to hear your own reading of how much that dominant thinking, which uh, sees only uh, money, value in money terms, to what extent you think that is now being shaken? Uh, yes, uh, lots of people are paying attention to what we said. Uh, it's, it's the reason, the, the position we have been taking step by step, first I challenged the banking system, it's designed wrong, that's what the running bank macro credit came about. And we demonstrated that it can work. <clears throat> and the system that we built for banking is the reverse of the system that exists. We have reversed everything they do. They go to the rich, we go to poor. They go to men, we go to women. They go to city, we go to rural village. They uh, ask for collateral, we dismiss collateral. In our entire banking system, there is no collateral. The word trust never meant anything to them. Everything banks do is based on distrust. They bring their lawyer in. So we defied all those rules and created. So this is one, and we're focused on poverty, how to address the poverty issue, help them become entrepreneurs so that they can grow by themselves. And I argued that the finance is the oxygen for people, it's uh, for entrepreneurial ability to come out. I said they're deprived from that oxygen. So they are, for human beings, are, uh, credit, uh, financial service is an oxygen. The moment you provide the oxygen, the entrepreneurial ability comes out. If you deny it, entrepreneurial ability remains uh, inside. You cannot find it anymore because it's useless. It doesn't work anymore. I said, the more, what we did, we connected this oxygen, uh, the financial services to people, and they become active and alive. It's there, but simply they couldn't use it, that oxygen was not there. 
So we did that. So that's what the financial system should be doing, creating micro-entrepreneurial banks. So that these people are micro-entrepreneurs. They know what to do, but they cannot do it. Even if they do it, you see a lot of them doing it with the money coming from the loan sharks because the formal bank don't do it. So loan shark benefit from it. The loan shark, but they got the name because they take away everything they earn. So the position of the poor people doesn't change. I said, if they had a genuine banking system, then they could retain their ownership of whatever they have earned and they can grow. So this is what the, one of the arguments that I made. And about how to get out of the poverty. And I said, poverty is not created by poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we build. So we have to address the system, not the people. So fix the system. Then I saw it's not only the poverty, it's created lots of other damages to the human being, the same system that we're talking about. So I was talking against the entire system, not just one piece or the other piece. I said, look at oh, oh, proof. That if you, if you look, look at the report card uh, of the entire uh, functioning of the system, it's a terrible report card you get. It's a report card of global warming. Yeah. We are going to be extinct because of that. I said, what the whole system has done to us is to bring human being uh, at a stage where we become the most endangered species on this planet. We don't have much time left. And you, see, you call it a system which brings it here. You talk about the violence. This, it is a systemic violence. Violence is built in. You punish people. You saw during the uh, pandemic, millions of people in India walking home because they have no livelihood left for them. They couldn't survive because they cannot pay the rent for the new holes they rent. And they have to now find food and home to go back to their native villages. And there's no transportation. That, that's why they were starting to walk. In. I said, what a shame. We couldn't find livelihood, survival livelihood, even survival livelihood in the places where they're born. What kind of economic is that? They have to come 100 miles, 200 miles, 500 miles away just for survival livelihood. I said, that's not economics at all. That's the wrong way of doing that. So I'm saying, accusing that, that this is done in so. And then all the economic activity has to be concentrated in a city so that everybody has to come to the city. Why? What is the reason that everybody has to come to the city? What's wrong with the rural uh, areas and the rural people? Why do they have to send all their children to come to the city to work in Indian slums and be, become criminals and all that? And then you make a, a push them into that situation in the first place. I said, then they have to sell all their produce, agricultural produce, whatever the produce in the villages, to the city so that they can uh, transform them into other products and sell it back to the villages. I said, why don't we keep our people at home and do the same transformation of the uh, agricultural products themselves at villages and sell it to you? Why you have to bring a people from the villages and products produced from the villages to come to the city to make you uh, the center of all economic activity. We can do the same thing. Simply, economy is done. No, no, you have to have a decent place where they can stay and so on, etc., etc. I said, you cannot say that they, they don't have the communication. They cannot have the electricity. They have everything now. What is the argument now? They have the electricity, they have the communication, they have the telephone, they have the uh, internet. Why do you have to bring everything there? Why don't they have their own economy? So village economy should be an independent economy. So there I uh, differ again. And then you have to make them all employees, all workers. See, what is the Why? I said human beings are born as entrepreneurs. They're all entrepreneurs. You force them to work so that some people can make money. And that's why you create wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in few hands. 1%. 1% of the global population own 99% of the wealth of the entire population. So remaining 99% of the population has to do with 1% of the wealth. What kind of economics is that? All the wealth is in the sky yeah. and all the population are in the bottom. So there's a gap between people and the wealth. So that doesn't make sense. That, that's another way you make people angry. Because you took away all my fruits of my labor and you are enjoying it doing it and I get no share of it. If I had been an entrep uh, entrepreneur to begin with, wealth will not be with you. Yeah. Wealth became, go, went into your hand because I had to work for you. So I collected the wealth for you and I was your mercenary. You 
You hired me as a mercenary to help you. If I'm an entrepreneur, I will not be helping you. I'll be picking up myself. I needed that money from entrepreneurship, for entrepreneurship from the financial system. Financial system closed the door down. Financial system poured in money for the rich people. Never gave you a penny. So this is how the whole system works. Mr. Singhan, uh, in closing, I would request you to share your advice with young people who would who want to do this, who want to uh, be part of the solution in the way that you have shown. What are some of the three or four things that they could do? Yeah, what I tell wherever them, they uh, are. Yes, uh, wherever they are, it doesn't matter whether they are in urban Bangladesh, India, doesn't matter wherever you are, USA, England, doesn't matter wherever you are. The, I tell the young people everywhere in the world that you are a privileged young people. You are very fortunate young people uh, because you are the most powerful generation in human history. Not gen uh, few, in a few in few years of history, in the entire human history. You are the most powerful generation, not because you are uh, smart, smarter than other generation. No, you are as, as. But you are now have control over technology in your hand. No other generation ever had so much power in their hand at your age. You have the, you have the power to change the whole world by yourself. You don't need to consult anybody. So first thing you have to do that if you are listening to me, I tell you that you ask yourself, is it true? If you feel, yeah, there may be some truth in it. If it is, then you, if you believe that you are most powerful, next, uh, next thing you have to do, figure out what use you want to make your power for. If you don't know what use you are, you are making the power for, this will be totally wasted. Don't waste your power. Make sure you, you use, and you have the power to change the world. So don't look for little things to do because you alone can change the world. It's your creative power. It's your thinking power, imagination power that will make it happen. You have to build a completely new world. This world is gone, finish. This civilization is the way on the way out. You have to make the step of beginning of new civilization to create a new world. And I define it in my way. I said, this will be a world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission, and zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. Because artificial intelligence is coming to take away all our work, whatever we do, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a worker, it doesn't matter, whether you're a singer, whether you're a professor, whether you're a journalist, all the work will be taken by artificial intelligence, and will become garbage on this planet. We don't want to make it happen. You will stop that. If you stop that, then we can survive. And not only survive, this is not very well, you have to be the peak of your creativity and show what a beautiful world you can make. And you can make it. And nothing is impossible for human being. Believe in that. Thank you so much, sir. You've, uh, as always, so inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.